Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another online event of the Java User Group Switzerland in collaboration with our friends from the Software Crafts Romandie Meetup Group. My name is Peti Koch and I'm your host from the Java User Group Switzerland. My name is Alexandre Kuva and I represent the Software Craft Romandie. And our guest today is Dragan Stepanovic. Welcome, Dragan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for coming. Before we start with Dragon's talk, uh, we have prepared some slides with some general information about the community and the next events and so on. I will quickly go through them. So first, a uh, big thank you to all our sponsors. First to the sponsors of the Java Use Group Switzerland. And also to the sponsors of the Software Crafts Romandy Meetup Group. Thank you very much for your support. Then you are now uh, in this big marker session on the top right. Uh, you have two tabs, the chat and the Q&A section. Um, please uh, post, for example, where are you located right now? It's very interesting for us uh, always to see where people are coming from. Um, and then if you have a question, please post it in the Q&A section. You have also the uh, possibility to vote for the questions. So the most interesting questions bubble up and will be uh, picked first by us. Um, uh, regarding the questions, we will do it uh, at the end of the talk. So you have plenty of time to uh, think about your questions. And, uh, yeah. Then if you want to get in touch with us, with the Java User Group Switzerland, uh, please feel free to use the Slack workspace. On the bottom, you see the URL for it, uh, slack.joc.ch. And for the uh, software craft from MMD community, uh, you can keep contact and get all the new events, uh, the English and the French French um, event too, uh, on the Meetup uh, community uh, website. Uh, next year, we're gonna have more live events uh, in Lausanne. So uh, stay tuned up, we don't, we don't have yet all the uh, um, all the events, but uh, we're starting to have uh, some interesting speaker coming. Thank you, Alex. Then uh, this event will be recorded and it will be published on the YouTube channel of the Java User Group Switzerland. Uh, if you subscribe to the channel and uh, click the bell, you will get the push notification. And um, the same for the Software Crafts Romandie meetup group. Then if you're interested in uh, the next uh, events uh, for Java user group, uh, there's a mailing list uh, which you can access via the joc.ch website. And there's a form where you can uh, enter your email address and then you will get the email notifications for the next events. Um, if you are interested in joining the Software Craft Someone Meetup group, just join the group. And from that point on, you will get also notifications about the next events. There are already uh, some of them in the pipeline. Then after the talk and the Q&A session, we all will be redirected to uh, Wonder Me uh, room. You see on the bottom the URL. You will uh, wander at .ch. Uh, You don't have to do anything. Um, you will be redirected from Big Mark to there. Um, feel free to join us there to have a chat with each other where we can see each other. We can build or form small discussion circles, or you can just discuss the two of us. Uh, Dragon will join us. And uh, you can ask questions uh, directly uh, to him, and uh, I'm sure it will be interesting. And last but not least, this is the last event of this year, 
Christmas is coming soon. So Merry Christmas, everyone, and all the best for the next year. Looking forward to see each other also in the next year. Uh, thanks for joining us. And with that, um, uh, yeah. please start on, uh, start with your part. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, thanks for the intro, uh, PT and Alex. And uh, yeah, let's uh, go straight into it. So uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for carving out the time. I understand it's uh, already um, yeah, a, a long day uh, for for all of us today. So I hope that the topic today is going to be interesting for you. And the title of the talk is Async Code Reviews Are Killing Your Company's Throughput. Um, which is, I must admit, quite a quite a strong um, claim, so to say. But I hope that I'll um, be able to kind of support the claim um, in in, um, in a way that makes it a bit more believable, so to say. So, um, yes, my name is Dragan Stepanovic. I work as a principal engineer at HelloFresh. Uh, and uh, before that, I've been in um, Berlin startup scene for some time now. Uh, the things that I'm mostly passionate about, yeah, XP, extreme programming, has been one of the topics that spanned most of my career, if not all of my career. And I think five plus years ago, I started diving into some other topics which are related to theory of constraints, lean systems thinking, and so on. I tend to rant a lot um, on my micro blog and uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. So yeah, if you're on the social networks, uh, these social networks, I would be, uh, I would love to connect with you. <clears throat> There's one terrifying fact about me that I have to mention in the start. It's that for some reason I put mayo on pizza and um, it happened at one point in, in my life and I just cannot resist it currently. So the things that I'm going to talk about today are going to be shared in in the manner of just sharing.dev. So for, for the folks that didn't uh, um, uh, saw this, the, the I'm not saying what you should do or what you shouldn't do. Um, it's perhaps, uh, uh, we have perhaps different contexts. So maybe the problem that I'm going to talk about today is not the same as yours, but um, the idea of me is to share the results, um, surprising systemic results that I got from the uh, quite a long study on the async code reviews and pull requests that we're going to dive into. Yeah. So to kick it off, <clears throat> I'm not sure how many of you have heard about the, this uh, quote, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. The idea I think comes from 80s when IBM had the biggest market share when it comes to the, to the um, uh, servers, uh, especially and uh, anyone who was doing procuring in, in companies, um, they had to answer a lot of questions if they didn't choose IBM. So choosing IBM was kind of a risk mitigation strategy um, because the downside risk was mitigated uh, in a sense, if something goes wrong, hey, it's IBM, um, you know, we did our best. And most of the folks have, uh, have uh, also cho uh, chosen IBM. So you try to go with the herd in order to get this um, risk, downside risk protection, right? Um, and when I think about this, it's um, what they tend to notice as well is the current ways of working on industry, which is uh, this thing workflow that they call peer based async code reviews. So I try to visualize it in this, um, in this graphic. And the idea is that Let's say we have a start of the sprint and we have two developers, Emma and Luca, and Emma uh, picks up one ticket, ticket number one, and Luca picks ticket number two. Uh, after some time, so Emma uh, does some coding, introduces some changes to the system, and at one point she thinks she's done, and she would like to invite her peers, teammates, for the review of, uh, of her work, right? And uh, so she asked for the review, but what happens, um, Luca, who is a reviewer in this case, is not available because he's working on his own ticket. And in the meantime, some other things are going around, uh, going on as well. So there are breaks, there's lunch, you know, there's meetings, refinement, planning, 
etc. Uh, right? Uh, there is also reviewing other PRs outside of business hours, um, etc. etc. And uh, but at one point he manages to get around and provides a review for the exchange. Um, he provides some feedback, asks for some changes which Emma tries to incorporate, but she's also busy in the meantime. Why? Because while she was waiting for Luca, she didn't want to be a bad employee or look as a bad employee. So she pulls in another ticket, ticket number three here, while increasing work in progress, and also has all of these uh, back and forths with, with all of these meetings and, and breaks, etc. So uh, whenever they get a response from each other, they're not able to react immediately because they're busy with something else. Eventually, they converge on a solution that they both agree on. So the pull request gets approved and eventually merge, right? Um, now, the thing that is kind of important is, is you look, if you look at the bottom side of, of this graphic, it's this way to process in time ratio. So if we just focus on ticket number one here, we're going to see that during his lifetime, how much uh, do we spend time effectively working on this item, whether it is coding, reviewing, incorporating feedback, etc., and how much uh, of a time during its lifetime, during its lead time, it spends waiting for someone's attention, which is this wait time. Right? So I mentioned that I did this um, a kind of ex extensive study on, on this uh, workflow by analyzing, I think now 40 plus very active repositories of a typical product development uh, team. So it wasn't open source. And um, when I get to work with the teams, what they tend to do is usually um, because we tend to have uh, different experiences, um, I try to figure out where the current team is at uh, currently and I try to meet them where they are, right? So if they're doing pull request uh, based async workflow, that's completely fine. Um, but, you know, instead of me talking about, you know, some other ways of working, uh, maybe our worlds are, are um, uh, way apart and it's not really easy to uh, to help anyone from that kind of standpoint. So uh, meeting people where they are is a guiding principle that I tend to have when um, coaching and mentoring teams. Um, and the reason why I did this study was because um, I was kind of curious, coming from a very different background, so as I mentioned, extreme programming, which involves a heavy collaboration face-to-face -face, uh, work, is I noticed uh, I had a nudge um, for uh, or a hunch for a couple of things um, when it comes to the dynamics in the way of working. And the things that I was curious about is you know, what are the effects of these delays that we see between the actors, because actors in the system are busy with something else. And how does that also affect the engagement that we tend to see? And how does it compare to the size of the pull request, right? Um, and I think currently I, I have around maybe 10,000 plus uh, pull requests analyzed or even um, two or three times more. I don't even know uh, at any point in time, the thing that I was really curious about is, to try to figure out like how much would be enough in order to get some uh, statistical significance when it comes to the study. So the things that I mentioned just before, um, the things that I cu was curious about engagement, when I say engagement, I mean, how much uh, conversation do I tend to see on the, on the pull request? Um, and what's the wait time for the pull request in terms of the um, definition that I mentioned before? And how does it relate to the, if we try to map it by the size. Right? So let's uh, dive into the first one. So the engagement part, uh, I was curious about it because there's a huge difference in the ways of working when um, you have this delayed and choked feedback, right? Delayed feedback because when I ask for feedback, the other party is not immediately available. So there is a delay between I get the response. And um, in the meantime, also pull some other stuff in, which makes me more unavailable uh, going forward. And there's also this other tendency that we tend to provide feedback for pull requests through some online platforms, as we know, GitHub, GitLab, etc. So I get a request for a review of pull request, and the way that I provide feedback is I type a comment, right? Uh, most most often, right? Some people tend to provide this feedback. Um, uh, verbally, but then it's also difficult to find availability in other people's time slots if they are busy with something else, right? So 
going async full uh, all the way tends to be, um, so to say, the, the typical way that they, uh, that they notice. So uh, if I need to write a comment instead of um, talking about it with someone, then this feedback is also tend to have no, um, um, tend to be choked in a sense of writing a comment is way more expensive than providing verbal feedback, right? The, just the sheer amount uh, of bandwidth of the medium that I'm using is kind of constraining it in a sense, right? Um, so, and how does this actually, the, 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 this way of working that I call high latency, low throughput feedback compared to the other way of working, which is uh, the one that we're going to talk about later, which is low latency and high throughput feedback, right? And um, I was also curious to see the engagement by size for the reasons that we're going to talk about soon. And this one was particularly intuitive part because I think all of us have encountered um, one of the um, um, typical cases that we're going to see also very soon. So let's go into the first scatter plot here. So um, on the each dot here represents a single pull request. And I think this was a data set of 500 pull requests. And um, on the X axis, you can see the size. Um, the way that I went about the size is tip, uh, simple lines of code different people tend to have uh, different ideas about the complexity of the pull request. Some people look at the lines of code, some people look at the number of files change, et cetera, et cetera, but they want to be this, uh, with this definition of lines of code. And on the Y axis, we can see the engagement. Um, the engagement, the way that they define it is the number of comments that they tend to see between the actors um, after the pull request has been, or the, after the uh, review has been asked for. And um, the number uh, that we see here is also number of non-trivial comments. And the way that they define the non-trivial comment is I wanted to avoid these plus one and thumbs up and LGTM looks good to me comments, which don't really provide value. So I filtered those out as a trivial comments and I counted, counted only non-trivial ones, right? And um, looking at this scatter plot, there's not much to say, you know, there's, uh, we cannot conclude, um, uh, much much here, except that, you know, most of the pull requests are, see less than 500 pull, uh, lines of code and um, it, they have, um, I'd say, maybe 85% of the engagement is uh, 12 um, that we can see here. But then I was thinking about it and, uh, you know, if you have a bigger piece of work and you have a uh, uh, feedback that is, let's say, two comments or whatever, in whichever way we think about the amount of feedback, it should be the same as if when I have a really small piece of, of uh, work, let's say I just renamed a method, you know, in Java, um, um, IntelliJ uh, uh, Shift F6, and it caused the five lines code of change, and I have um, same set or same amount of feedback that I, that you got, right? So. Think about it like 1,000 lines of code, pull request, and I get two comments. And if I have versus when I have five lines of code, I have two comments, right? It it shouldn't be the same. I mean, I'm comparing it here on the same axis, so to say, but it shouldn't be the same because the amount of feedback per amount of work, so to say, is is different. So then, what happens if I try to normalize this, right? So what we tend to see here is that actually, you know, as um, if we have on the y-axis engagement per size, so this is the number of non-trivial comments per hundred lines of code, what we tend to see as we start increasing the size of the pull request, the amount of engagement per line of code, per size of the pull request, tends to go down uh, exponentially. And the interesting thing here to think about is, you know, for me, this means that, um, you know, if we use pull requests, for a reason to build the quality in, right? Because we want to get feedback from our peers if the way that we went about the work is, you know, the right way and, and ask for your opinion, but we're actually not able to get it in a sense of, you know, as the size of the pull request increases, we get less and less uh, feedback per size of the pull request. Then we are also not able to build the quality in, right? So um, for me, this means that if, if we are building the quality in by having, uh, getting a feedback, if we're not able to get the feedback, then we're not able to build the quality in, right? I'm not saying anything related to the left-hand side of the scatter plot, meaning that if we have higher engagement or higher amount of feedback, 
I'm not saying that we have quality because it really depends on the on the quality of the feedback, right? So, um, and, and this was kind of intuitive, right? For me, in a sense that, you know, um, I really love this quote, never had a huge PR that didn't look good to me. So um, if, if I was live now in, in, um, in a sense, if, if we had face-to-face -face this, this meetup, right? I would ask by a show of hands, you know, how many people have um, encountered this situation where you have a huge pull request and you just don't feel that as if you're um able to course correct in any way the the the, the pull request and you know to build the quality because the thing has already been done right the you know someone has invested uh, seven days uh, building this feature and this pull request and suddenly after a thousand lines of code you are asked for feedback and it's already too late right the thing has already already been done what you tend to you know what we like the system is incentivizing is just to not not react uh, in a sense uh, because it takes a long time to you know it takes a huge allocation from my side as a reviewer to you know review 1,000 lines of code, um, and and also you know there are lots of back back and forths between me and the author. Plus the author invest um, is if they invested seven days, let's say working on this feature, um, some cost fallacy and this emotional attachment also kicks in, so it's difficult to steer in in the conversation and and the and the, and the work in a sense. So um, what we what they tend to see is like this looks good to me, uh, thumbs up and just approve and merge and then pray that this thing is going to get fixed at a later point in time, which I'm sure you know it never happens, right? So uh, that was one of the uh, systemic insights that I was kind of um, expecting in a sense, right? Uh, because you know it's like just in, um, uh, extrapolating from the experience that that we have in the industry. Um, but then going into the wait time, there was the part that uh, of one particular systemic insight that I didn't expect. Right? So let's go back to this uh, graphic uh, of Emma and Luca and let's focus on ticket number one. As I mentioned, you know, the thing to look at is this wait to processing time ratio, right? So um, I was really curious to see what is the wait time um, that I get to see on different pull requests. And the way that I wanted, that I um, went about um, calculating it, I had to use approximation because as you know, uh, it's very difficult to have a, a super accurate um, data when it comes to that. But, and there are a couple of also important assumptions and approximations that I'm going to talk about a bit later that needs to hold true in order for this approximation to to be um, accurate enough, so to say. And the way that I went about it for calculating wait time, wait time is if we think about Emma, so she pulled, she has pulled in a ticket and uh, started working on it. She has a couple of commits, let's say, and at one point she raises a pull request, right, and asks for a feedback. And um, at that point in time, I started calculating um, the, the, the clock for wait time starts um, uh, ticking and um, the, the amount of time that they see between that point in time and uh, until the pull request has been merged is at the wait time that they calculate as a wait time for the whole pull request. Um, now, it um, doesn't have to be true, right? In a sense of um, the processing time, so the touch time or processing time, the time that Emma has been effectively working on this, on this uh, pull request until she raised the pull request, can also have a wait time, right? Because she has other things to do in the meantime, meetings and stuff like that, right? Um, so the wait time can also have processing time, right? So if I um, raise a, a pull request and I get, get some feedback and I add, uh, I do some um, rework, I rework some of the things of the, of the pull request that they got. Um, and uh, if I see a, a commits, uh, um, uh, lots of commits after asking for pull requests, I will know that there's lots of rework and lots of process time being involved in the wait time itself. So the approximation tends to be less, uh, less accurate, right? Um, so the other thing is also that processing time and flow efficiency, flow efficiency, we're going to go um, a bit later into it, but just think about the fact that um, um, the teams that I've been um, analyzing have heavily used to get rewrite practices, meaning um, squashing and rebasing, uh, git commit um, amending and stuff like that, which rewrite the history. So what tends to happen is actually that 
uh, if I use these techniques, then I squash the processing time that they tend to see. So, and this time is less accurate, accurate for uh, a bigger PRs, right? Than for the smaller PRs. Um, so that's another thing here. And um, one important thing was also that the wait time um, was way more accurate when it comes to measuring the processing time, especially for these reasons. And for the conclusions that they had at the end, wait time it was actually the only thing that was uh, that was here uh, important. Um, I mean, way more important than the processing time. Um, and yes, the thing that I mentioned about PR size, the way that I went about this measuring through simple lines of code change. So. Um, some of the results that they got to see is this is just a um, typical snapshot of the of, of, of some of the results and here we have a 500 pull request merged pull request pull request that have um, spanned a period of six months so it took us six months to so to say produce these 500 merged pull requests right and the amount of wait time that they calculated for for these was that the um, cumulative wait time for these 500 pull requests was 28 months um, in, in total, right? Which is a huge amount of accumulated wait time in the system for the work that is sitting there, just sitting there and waiting for someone's attention, right? So the impact of that is very important um, if you look at it from this angle. So if we deliver value to the customers by changing the system that we have right, through, through software, right? Then if we delay changing the system, then we also delay potential value to the customers. I'm not saying that, um, you know, 1000 lines of code is going to bring value to the customers because it can be just um, an update of a library, right? Doesn't really provide value to the customers in a sense, in, in a direct sense. But for the cases when we introduce, when there is value in the things that, um, that, we, um, that we work on and we introduce to change the system, this value is stuck in the system because it's waiting for someone's attention, right? So um, that's very important because by delaying the potential value by it sitting there and waiting for someone's attention, you're also inhibiting fast iterations, right? And faster learning and faster outcomes. Right? So that's a very important thing to have in mind when, when talking about this. So if we go into the scatter plot for the wait time, um, what, so here on the X axis is size and on the Y axis is wait time in hours. Um, and, you know, again, there's not much to see here. Um, like most of the PRs had less than 200 hours of wait time. But thinking about it, you know, if I have, a, um, um, particular amount of, of work done and I need to wait, let's say, um, um, a, a particular amount of time, right? It's not the same as if I have way smaller amount of work and I need to wait the same amount of time. To give you an example, if I have 1000 lines of pull request, code of pull request, and I mean real work, like not updating the, you know, the, the uh, library, uh, external library, but someone has put, um, a considerable effort to produce this work of 1000 lines of code pull request and they need to wait um, two days to get the review it's not the same as if someone goes and just renames a method and has five lines of code pull request and need to wait five uh, to wait two days for uh, for the review right so because the cost of of, of uh, waiting time is way higher for the smaller um, work than for the bigger work if they need to wait the same amount of time, right? So then what happens if we try to normalize this and we try to plot it um, as on the y-axis now we have wait, wait time per size, which was minutes per lines of code, right? And the thing that was really surprising for me when I was thinking about this is actually um, as we started decreasing the size of the pull request, the wait time per size tends to go exponentially up. And um, like I have been advocate for a small pull request for pull request for a long time, right? And I think they are better than being big pull requests for the reasons that we talked about the quality, right? But then what we are saying here is actually that um, you know if we keep the uh, the same way of working uh, async uh, code reviews, right? Actually, if we have a smaller pull request, we are going to incur way more wait time per size um, as we as we decrease the size of the pull request, right? 
And for me, like when you think about it, what does this actually mean? What does it translate to, right? So for me, it translates into the cost of code review per size is going exponentially up as we decrease the size of the pull request, right? And um, the same thing um, you get to have also when you think about it is if you have a test suit that takes 20 minutes to run, if it takes me 20 minutes to get feedback from tests, I'm definitely not going to run it after every line of code change because it doesn't make economic sense, right? So I'm, I'm going to uh, increase the amount of changes that they introduced to the system before running the, the test in order to make economic sense of it, right? So it could mean like me coding for one hour before running the, the test suit. Um, but then what actually the system is telling me, hey, the cost of code, the cost of running the test is really high, so use it very wisely, right? So it's kind of incentivizing me to push back into the bigger batches, right? Introducing more changes to the system before running the test. And this is not a good thing to have, right? Because then after one hour or two hours of work and then running the test and seeing five tests failing, I have no idea immediately to pinpoint at which step in particular did I make a mistake, right? So they're huge, it's like uh, looking for a, uh, for a needle in a haystack and it's really difficult to, to get around this. And we know it also from, you know, deployments, if you if you delay your deployments and accumulate the amount of changes, if something goes wrong in production, you're going to have a really difficult time troubleshooting and, and figuring out. So it involves also lots of stress and lots of free work and stuff like that, right? So we're saying we want small pull requests, right? For the reason that, that, that I mentioned before that. So it's um, quicker to review, it's quicker to, to write, right? It takes less time allocation for the reviewer and higher engagement. Right, uh, and it's also less risky, and you know, shorter lead time to change and higher de deployment frequency. If you, if you think in the accelerate uh, metrics terms, right. But what we're saying is, if we keep the same way of working with async code reuse and we reduce the size of the pull request, the system is actually incentivizing us um, for a, a bigger pull request. Right. So if I need to wait two, um, let's say two hours or even worse, two days to get a review for a simple um, method rename. I'm either not going to rename it and I'm going to uh, postpone this change, right? Uh, which also means postponing the refactoring, which means, you know, the healthiness of the system is, um, uh, work in the system is delayed, right? Um, and I'm going to, to batch up this work with something else that I'm going to work on later. Um, so I'm going to slide back into the, into the bigger batches. So when I talk about these uh, systemic incentives, it, um, it's difficult not to mention in this quote from Edward Deming for any system thinkers out there, the system that people work in and the interaction with people may account for 90 or 95% of performance, which actually means that if you look at the behavior in the system, uh, what uh, he's saying uh, is that 95% of the behavior that you see in the system is driven by the system. Right. So the behavior is driven by the incentives in the system. And um, to kind of um, to um, illustrate this, right, it, it feels like this um, uh, Sisyphus uh, work in a sense, you know, I'm trying to reduce the size of the pull request in our team. I mean, we as a team are trying to reduce the average size of the pull request, but it's getting, it's getting more difficult and we're um, losing also throughput to something that we're going to go into a bit later. So. I was thinking about it, you know, and I was thinking about why this might be the case. And the way that I went about it is um, I use this diagram, which is called uh, cause the loop diagram. So for anyone also coming from uh, systems thinking, this might be something that you're familiar with. And I'm going to give you a very short crash, crash course on, on uh, cause the loop diagrams. So the idea is um, you can see here the, the these labels are variables, right? So here we can see PR size and let's say the motivation or incentive to review, right? And they're connected with the line. The line can be either red, which is minus, or it can be a blue, which is plus. Right? So the minus is actually saying that uh, connection between two variables is saying that two variables are going into the opposite direction. So if I increase the size of the pull request, motivation or incentive to review goes down and vice versa. If I reduce the size of the pull request, motivation or incentive to review 
goes up for the reasons that I mentioned, right? Less time allocation, building quality in, I feel uh, more engaged also and you know, have a sense of having ability to build the quality. And the other type of the causal link, which is plus, uh, means that two variables are going into in the same direction. So if one moves up, the other one also moves up and vice versa, right? Um, so let's try to work through quickly through, through this diagram. Um, the important part here is also to notice this R and, and B, right? Um, so once you map all of these variables and connect them with these causal uh, links, you might in, um, uh, discover some feedback loops, which can be reinforcing or balancing feedback loops. So reinforcing or positive re uh, feedback loops are the loops that um, that continue growing. It's kind of a snowball effect, right? You can think about it. And the balancing feedback loops are the feedback loops that kind of um, seek the, um, the target in a sense. So it can mean that, you know, I try to push the system, but it's going back. Right? It's kind of going into this, it's, uh, this um, what's it called in, um, I think in uh, the, the mean, mean reversion, right? So you're going back into the stable state, so to say. So let's go and try to work through it by trying to reduce the size of the pull request, right? If I reduce the size of the pull request, the motivation or incentive to review goes up, right? And if the motivation or incentive uh, to review from the reviewer side is going up, that uh, translates uh, usually into the author of the PR uh, waiting less for a feedback, right? Uh, and if author is waiting less for the feedback, they're also perceiving the cost of code review per line of code as cheap, right? Because if you get faster feedback from my reviewers, you know, that's the system is telling me, hey, the, the feedback is quite cheap. So, uh, and what that means, if the feedback is cheap, you know, I'm going to keep, uh, to be able to keep reducing the size of the pull request, right? So there's kind of a reinforcing feedback loop that was, that is kind of, um, you know, a, a behavior that we're seeking as well. But then on the other hand, when we think about it, right? So this is the reinforcing feedback loop. But when we think about it also, if I reduce the size of the pull request, uh, suddenly, you know, uh, in a given amount of time, I have, instead of one pull request, and I just halve the size of the pull request uh, once, the number of pull requests to review goes up, right? Here it's, it's doubled, right? For a given um, amount of time, right? So that also means that there are more um, pull requests to review in flight, right? And if you have more pull requests to review as a reviewer, I'm going to get um, more interruptions, right, um, for for the for the work, right. So I'm going either to you know try to context switching uh, constantly between these reviews, or I'm just going to say, hey, I'm overloaded, so you know these things um, need to wait, right, and then they sit there in the queue and uh, accumulate the wait time. And if the number of or of interruptions um, for a reviewer goes up the motivation or incentive to review, uh, particular uh, in terms of the the whole set of the pull request. Uh, also goes down. So what we have here is, uh, you know, we work the other way uh, the, uh, to the other side. We're going to say actually this other part of the of the uh, behavior that we're seeing is actually trying to balance out this reinforcing feedback loop, meaning that is driving back the pull request size into the bigger pull request. And uh, for the reasons that that are here, the motivation or incentive to review from these two different sides are different. Here. They're kind of conflicting, right? So to give you one of the example, right? Um, if uh, with every halving of the pull request size, right, you get twice as many more interruptions for each of the reviewers of a given PR, right? And then when you multiply that by the number of the pull requests in flight, and let's imagine that we have one person, one PR, right? And you get the total number of interruptions in the team, right? So uh, if it's mandatory for at least one person to review a pull request, and if you have four developers in a team, total number of interruptions in the team increases eight times just for one halving of the PR, four times, four, four five, uh, times two. Uh, so um, there's, a, there's a huge shift in the dominance between this um, reinforcing and the feedback loop, which is trying to balance out the behavior that we see. So, um, try to go back to my notes. okay. So that's kind of my, at least hypothesis that they have related to why do we tend to see this behavior, right? Uh, my my um, shot at trying to understand that. And if we um, uh, think about the flow efficiency, one of the metrics that they mentioned before, 
So flow efficiency is a metric that comes from lean. And for the folks that are not familiar with it, we take a look at um, a particular work item that is flowing through our system and look at its lead time, how long did it take from start until finished. And we try to figure out how much of this lead time this item has spent uh, working and how much is spent uh, waiting. And we try to figure out how much of the lead time is actually a work time, right? So uh, that, that means that, you know, the higher the flow efficiency, the better the process because things stay uh, less time stuck in our system. So they flow faster, right? And uh, vice versa, if, if the flow efficiency is low, that actually tends to mean that most of the time um, work items spent waiting in our system, right? Not being actively worked on. So I tried to, um, um, I came up with with this also calculation for the progress that I've been, um, that I've been doing. And I have like a bunch of, of the metrics that I was really curious about, but this one, one this one was one of the of the important ones. And the way that I went about it is, um, uh, I think this is a set of icon pull requests. And again, on the x axis, we can see the size. On y, we can see the average flow efficiency for PRs up to size. Meaning that if you look at one dot here that is at let's say a hundred lines of code. What it did is, I, from these 500 pull requests or 1,000 or 2,000 pull requests, I don't even remember now um, how, how big but it is, but the behavior was same in all of these uh, the repositories, is that I um, take a subset of these pull requests uh, and I just take pull requests that are up to 100 lines of code and I try to calculate its average flow efficiency, right? And what I got to see is that um, it starts to plummet at one point. For this particular data set, it's around, let's say, 120 lines of code, right? Now, why is this important? It's actually telling us uh, that the flow efficiency plummets as we decrease the size of the pull request, meaning that the amount of the waste in our system tends to go exponentially up as we decrease the size of the pull request and if we keep working in the same way with these async code reviews, right? And um, very important um, consequential point from this is that if we just look at the 300 lines of code change, right? And um, let's say that we want to introduce 300 lines of code change to our system, right? We can, and let's say we can do it in, in two ways. One way is we can split these into 15 PRs of 20 lines of code, or we can introduce one PR of 300 lines of code. And what we can see from this uh, behavior that we see on this diagram, is that the cumulative lead time of introducing these 300 lines of code change through 15 PRs of 20 lines of code is going to be way longer than the cumulative lead time of just one PR of 300 lines of code change, right? And um, it's the, this thing that we talked about, wait time per line of code going exponentially up as we decrease the size of the pull request is corresponding to this behavior, which is the thing that we say if the lead times are going to skyrocket, then the throughput is also going to go down, right? So small PRs are not always a good thing. There is a thing that we're actually trading off between uh, big PRs and small PRs when it comes to this particular way of work, right? So, um, and to try to explain it also, again, through the causal loop diagram, right? Um, the interesting thing to think about is if you, if you have a pull request, right? and you reduce the size of the pull request, uh, the processing time per size tends to be either constant or, or it tends to go linearly down. Now, why is this? Because, you know, I, as author of the pull request, when I do some coding, I'm mostly like in, in PR sense, in this async uh, code reviews workflow, I don't depend on anyone else mostly when it comes to that, right? I code, you know, I might look at Stack Overflow, or Google, the things and stuff like that, but I am progressing, right? I'm not waiting for someone that is not available. But when it comes to the wait time, it's a different story, right? When with wait time, um, I am dependent on someone else because I need to wait for a review, uh, for a reviewer to become available to get a review, right? So the, as we saw, wait time per size, as we decrease the size of the pull request, goes up exponentially, causing the wait to processing time ratio to go exponentially up as we decrease the size of the pull request and the flow efficiency uh, to plummet the thing that we that we see, saw just before, which actually means that the throughput also um, uh, goes down, All right? So 
Um, big pull request, lack of quality, right? We're trying to, to build the quality in, but it, it's not really easy, right? System is pushing against us. And small pull requests, you know, we're jeopardizing the, we're losing throughput, right? So uh, we are forced actually to make a trade-off between the throughput and the quality, and we're trying to figure out where do we put, like what's the, so to say, optimal pull request size in order to get a good balance between these two things that we're trying to optimize for, right? The everlasting dilemma, speed versus quality. And for anyone that is familiar with uh, with the work of Don Reinersen, um, who has this great book uh, called The Principles of Product Development Flow, this is actually a typical U-curve batch optimization um, uh, dilemma, so to say, right? So, um, and it, it's been like um, for, for decades already been talked about, and the the idea is actually that you know um, there are two things, two costs that we have: transaction cost and the holding cost. And we're trying to trade off between these two in order to find the optimal batch uh, batch size, right? And uh, thinking about this, uh, whenever I say speed versus quality or throughput versus quality, I tend to have this um, association associating idea of the Dora research that has been done. <clears throat> Um, uh, DevOps research and assessment, and the results that have been a uh, five year long study, as far as I remember, it has, uh, and the results for this have been presented in the Accelerate book. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. And the one of the biggest myths that it, that it busted through uh, this research, research is that, you know, we're not talking anymore about speed versus stability. So either speed or throughput or stability, as, as they um, uh, call it in, in DevOps but you it's actually both throughput and stability so you're either going to have both throughput and stability or neither throughput nor stability and and that's kind of really important thing um to to have in mind um because i tend to hear a lot about this this maxim there is always a trade-off that is uh, true but some trade-offs actually do not exist because the underlying assumption is flawed and in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about ways of addressing this. And uh, perhaps you're able to actually have your cake and eat it too. And um, let's go back to this problem that we have at hand, right? So cost of code review per size goes exponentially up as we decrease the size of the pull request if we keep the same way of working, which means that the throughput uh, and the flow efficiency that we saw <coughs> plummets. So we were saying that we actually want to reduce the size of the pull request because we want to have smaller batches, but we don't want to lose the throughput, right? So let's work uh, from uh, let's uh, let's work uh, work it uh, backwards, right? So if we don't want to lose the throughput as we decrease the size of the pull request, we are saying that the cost of code review per size should not must not go up exponentially as we reduce the size; it needs to stay constant, right? But in order for us to stay constant, we need actors in the system that as we decrease the size of the pull request, they need to react exponentially faster and faster and faster, right? So, when I, and when I say actors, I mean authors and reviewers, like right? actors in, the, in this process, right? <clears throat> so in order to have exponentially faster reaction time, in order to have a constant, co co code, um, cost, constant cost of code review per size, the problem actually why actors are not able to react immediately for a small pull request because they're busy with something else, right? So the availability of actors in order for them to be able to react faster as we decrease the size of pull, pull request, the availability needs to go exponentially up, right? As we decrease the size of the pull request in order to, at the end, not lose the throughput. So when we think about this uh, visual, right, if we focus on ticket number one here, what we're saying that, you know, if we have this, let's say a big pull request and this ticket number one is representing a big pull request um, and actors are, are, um, are reacting with these delays that you saw, right? So what we're saying, if we want to reduce the size of the pull request and keep the throughput constant as we reduce it, Luca and Emma have to react way faster than before, right? And if you want to have even smaller PRs, right, they need to react uh, almost immediately because otherwise the weight to processing time ratio tends to go up exponentially. Just when you think about it, you know, if it takes me, 
let's say, five minutes to rename a method and I need to wait uh, 10 minutes to get a review, it's already, the wait time is already two times as, as longer as the processing time, right? So they have to react um, way faster than they used to as we decrease the size of the pull request. So that leads me to the um, conclusion uh, of, the, of the study that they had when it comes to, uh, to throughput and the, and the quality, uh, but especially the throughput. In order to not exponentially lose the throughput while reducing the average size of the pull request, people need to get exponentially closer and closer in time, right? So they're moving from async to a more sync work, right? And the sync work actually guarantees availability of the other side, right? Because if someone is on a call with me, they're not able to do something else. They are able to do, of course, but, you know, like um, as, as a base case, right? they are not on a different meeting or they are not, you know, um, going for lunch and stuff like that, right? So I'm able to get a review continuously. As I type uh, the code, right, I'm able to get a review immediately, right? So to try to map it here, right, the uh, for this, uh, on this causal loop diagram, the problem that we had was this conflict of the um, incentive, right, that was caused from this balancing feedback loop of number of interruptions per reviewers, right? But what if you cannot get interrupted because you're not doing anything else? What if the other side is immediately available for you, right? Because the other side is working on the same thing as you are working, or they are not working on anything else, so they are immediately available to to um, to work on the thing uh, on on the review that they that you ask from them, right? So they are not effectively interrupted. So this is a segue to this port uh, to this. Uh, parallel universe um, to the co-creation patterns, um, at least uh, uh, at least that's the way that I uh, call them, more programming and pair programming, right? So I'm sure most of you have heard about it, right? Um, the idea is actually to um, uh, to get people to work on the, on the same thing at the same time, right? Uh, um, and um, what you get as a as a one of the big benefits that you get of this is that you have immediate availability of the other party, which enables you to have this continuous code review, right? As you as you type the code, um, the code is being reviewed as well, right? So what it effectively does to this U um, curve batch optimization curve, we are actually minimizing the transaction cost, shifting it left, which allows us to have uh, a batch size that is actually one line of code, right? So if we try to map this to the scatter plot that we talked about before, how would this scatter look like had we done a continuous code review, right? After each line of code. So we would have this single dot because a pull request would actually be, I mean, there are other things that need to be involved as well, right? In order for you to merge the pull request, you know, you need to have enough safety that and confidence that this thing, uh, this change um, is going to work with production and, you know, whatever is needed. Uh, but um, all that um, given, right, uh, if you're doing test during development in order to uh, XP practices, let's say that the pull request is actually from the reviewer's standpoint, because, you know, we're talking about the code reviews here, is uh, actually, we are actually able to drive it down to one line of code, and the wait time per size is actually zero, because we are able to get the immediate feedback, right? And if you think about the uh, engagement per size, like, from the terms of the of the feed, amount of feedback, so uh, I'm going to claim that the feedback, the amount of feedback that we're getting, is going to be way higher. Why? Because it's going to be way more timely. So if the feedback is more timely, uh, I also expect to have more engagement, right? Um, and the other thing is also the feedback is providing this verbal, way way richer form of uh, medium. Uh, compared to, you know, a delayed feedback through some GitHub uh, pull request where I need to type a comment, you know, load up a solution, download uh, the code, run the test, blah, 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 and stuff like that. So there's huge transaction costs also involved in that. If you want to reduce the uh, size of the pull request, this thing becomes a bottleneck at one point. And then people figure out, okay, you know, if, if I want to, let's say, um, uh, let's, let's, let's have a thought experiment and, and say that, you know, I want to have a pull request, um, uh, of one line of code, right? Then I'm going to have lots of the pull requests just waiting there, sitting for someone to to review them. And at one point, you know, uh, when the let's say that the other 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 party, uh, the reviewer is immediately available, 
then you know as soon as i push the code and create a pull request of online of code they would have to go to the to this tool and um, do the uh, sorry just to, oh, yeah. uh, do the the code um, review immediately and um, then this tool becomes a bottleneck right so to sum it up you know uh, instead of us thinking about throughput or quality you know perhaps the underlying assumption is not really correct and you know i would say that perhaps we can have you know um throughput and quality when it comes to that um and um, one last part uh, when it comes to the pr score one of the metrics that i use here um you perhaps notice it in this sidebar but the idea is actually that, you know, I was thinking, okay, what are the things that we try to optimize for in this whole review process? Um, so uh, from this, uh, from the set of the metrics that I talked about. So you want the size to go down, right? We want the wait time per size to go down, right? And we want to engage in precise to have it, um, uh, to keep it high, or at least not to go down uh, because, you know, that it's a precondition for building the quality. So, uh, I try to put it in a single number. I mean, it's not, uh, of course, not ideal. It's one of the ways of looking at that, but it was very important from uh, one angle that we're going to talk about um, now. Um, so, you know, if I have a, uh, here we can see just a simple formula, right? Size times wait time in seconds divided by one plus engagement, one plus because engagement might be zero. So I don't want to divide by zero. And then I started thinking, okay, you know, like what is actually the score if we do co-creation, right? If we have continuous code review. So actually size is one, right? That's a uh, lines of code. Wait time in seconds is zero and the engagement is some number, some constant, whatever, right? It doesn't matter. But this evaluates to zero. Um, and I had to do a, lo a natural logarithm of this. Why? Because for the async code reviews from these data sets that they had, the results were so huge that you know it it didn't make sense to, to plot it in in a linear scale so i just used the um, the logarithm uh, natural logarithm scale and the result actually for uh, co-creation was zero which is actually from this uh, um, uh, definition of the pr score from this matrix is the ideal result that you can have the best result that you can have the lower the result uh, the better right and if i plot this so these are the pull requests here done in async code review fashion. And you can notice the difference, like magnitude of difference, because this is a logarithmic scale on y-axis between these two worlds. So this is kind of, you know, one of the ways to, to visualize it. And again, going back to the start of my talk, I tend to try to figure um, out together with the teams how to visualize the current ways of working that they have in order to figure out if there is a better way um, or some other ways to, to try it out, right? Um, and, and this one was really, uh, one of the um, impactful visuals, visuals that, that, um, were produced. So to sum it up, um, one of the things that I mentioned is that, you know, from, from this, uh, standpoint, the optimal size of the progress is one line of code that is reviewed immediately as it's being typed. And I honestly don't know of a better way to achieve it than by pair and more programming. Um, and um, for the end, I was trying also to uh, figure out the the way to you know map this into the how how does this look like if had we been doing um, uh, 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 pull requests versus versus pairing and the way that they understood is actually that you know the, if we do continuous code reviews we are going to have way sooner. Um, um, results, uh, which means also accelerating the feedback and getting uh, learnings and, and faster feedback loops in order to provide at the end faster value or sooner value for, uh, for our customers. So one last thing, um, we've been told all along that we'll achieve more if we limit and delay our interactions as humans and hope that you now also have a data informed reason to not really believe that. So uh that's all from my side uh and uh yeah now i would um we can switch back to pt and figure out if there is um questions that might, you might have thank you very much dragon very interesting um i think we'll pick up the questions uh now next uh
please uh, post your questions there and also uh, vote on the questions. So the top uh, vote the questions bubble up to the top. And uh, now I have a little echo. Assuming, so the first question from Christian, assuming that the diversity gives you better results during pair programming, how do you avoid the pair to synchronize in their thought process and to fall into a common state of flow? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. I think that's one of the things that they tend to get often as a question. Um, so, you know, if we try to avoid this tunnel, we try to avoid the, the bias towards the tunnel effect. And, you know, we're not sure if these two people are having the same set of assumptions that we would try to avoid. So uh, ways to mitigate it is to either accelerate the changes in the pairs. So one way is to do a pair programming is this mode of promiscuous pairing, where after some time, uh, let's say one or two hours, we change the pairs and we integrate someone else to uh, into the pair, so the oldest, so to say, the, the, the person that has been the oldest in the pair shifts to some other pair and the new person joins the pair. Um, so that's one way of accelerating the knowledge sharing across that, but even better way is more programming. When you have more programming, you have everyone that is needed uh, being there, providing feedback uh, immediately, timely, and right to reach feedback when it comes to that. So um, that's, that's another way to, let's say, avoid these uh, perhaps common biases that we tend to or might might see in, in this uh, sense. And also, if, if you do pairing, right, the important thing to keep in mind is like who is pairing with whom, you know, having in mind about um, these uh, pairing matrices. And, you know, you perhaps don't, don't want two juniors to pair because, you know, you would like them to, to provide to get some feedback from from someone who is a bit more experienced. So um, like crafting the uh, thinking about um, the ways to to create pairs in a team is is important. Hope this answers the questions here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So from uh, Thomas Moser, so should a pair not be reviewed any further when it has been programmed in pair? Oh. Sorry, yeah. I can come back. Yes. Okay, can you see me now? Yeah, with your back. Okay, cool. Uh, that was a wrong button. Um, so the same thing, if we, if let's say we pair, but we need one more person to review, the same thing uh, is stands as true, right? So we still have this async code review. And what I would advise in this case, if you need someone else also to review, why not involve them in the session itself? Uh, in order not to incur all of this cost and lose the throughput and, uh, and all of these things that I mentioned, right? So it's better if two people pair. So if you have three people that are involved in this process, the worst thing that you can have is going full async between three of them. Uh, a bit better is to have uh, two persons pair and then get the uh, async review from someone uh, from the third person. But uh, even better way is actually to include all of them into the same session and do a more programming uh, in order to avoid these um, economics and, and the system behavior that we tend to see that it drives uh, in, in the system. So, yeah. Next okay. question from Benno. Would it be an option to not do reviews at all for some changes like, i.e. the simple method rename, just commit it and push? Yeah. That's also one of the option. Um, one of the options, uh, it, it really depends on the team, like how much trust they have in the tools that they use. You know, uh, we definitely know that that refactoring um, capabilities, let's say, of IntelliJ are pretty secure, so to say, are pretty confident. So, you know, renaming a method shouldn't be something that is um, that, that involves high risk, but you know, um, that's that's a conversation that I think every team needs to have. Uh, and even some changes that don't involve these typical ID factoring, um, let's say, a, um, I don't know, documentation update or you know, whatever you think you would need a review because you have high level of confidence is a thing that also doesn't have to be like raise a pull request or to appear a programming session for that. You can just push it to 
the trunk. So yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So uh, from Danilo Biela, have any of these st statistics been compared with doing the same in pair? Yes. So um, interesting thing here is actually I I don't even need to do that because the process itself guarantees that the wait time is going to be zero, right? So when you think about it, like um, let's 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 find some other metaphor. If I if I bike to work every day, forty five minutes there and back, am I going to be fit enough, so to say, right? So most probably yes, because the process itself guarantees it, right? And if I have someone sitting next to me and providing continuous, immediate code review, like what's the wait time? The wait time is going to be zero, right? So. Um, in that sense, um, I, I didn't, because the process itself guarantees the, these results, results, right? When you think about it also, test and development, when you have test and development, when you're doing TDD, do you really have a need to measure code coverage, right? If you're doing TDD, like w my experience with the teams was the confidence and the coverage is so high that we don't have a need to measure it, right? Because the process itself guarantees, uh, code coverage high enough that we don't even have to look at it. Okay, thank you. Then next question from Daniel. Are there any tools out there that use AI for PR review or pre-process the PR before a human has to look at it? So I assume this would then re reduce the waiting time for the first feedback. Yeah, uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, I think there were some efforts from a couple of people that I know, at least personally, but I don't remember seeing any commercial product, which doesn't have to mean that there aren't, but I, it's just that I'm not, um, uh, not that, that, that I know of, yeah. Okay, so another missed uh, question from Danilo. I need to rephrase. Um, there was a lot of math for discrediting a sync, not so much in favor of sync. People won't believe me tomorrow. Are there more statistics? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it really depends what more uh, would someone look like uh, look for, right? And I think it's also kind of context specific because people come from different backgrounds and different perspectives. But for the conversations that I had uh, with the teams that I worked, um, it was it was very logical after this whole um, study, extensive study, and looking crunching all of these data and looking at all of these systemic behavior to understand the U um, curve optimization of the batch size, and you know, I mean, it involves lots of the lots of the work related to the lean and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. Um, at least for me, it was kind of enough. Uh, perhaps if you have any idea what is something that you would like to have, you know, um, maybe that's something that I could uh, look look for and, and try to crunch that as well. But I think it's also kind of context specific because it depends on the experience and the background. So the next question is from Noel. How is quality measured in this approach? Maybe async re reviews are better because the reviewer has time to think about the changes in detail. So it's the same yeah. with the tunnel mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, um, I'm not sure that, you know, if you have a small pull request and async code reviews, you know, I, I would assume, or I treat this question as a question not between sync and async, but between, um, let's say, long, long reviews and short reviews, right? And um, from my experience, when people don't have to context switch all the time between different reviews and different meetings and stuff like that, but they are already in the flow with the author and working on the same thing, the system incentives are completely different as well, because there's one really interesting thing that happens as, as a dynamic with the, with the pull request is that you have author and you have reviewers and um, the, the reviewers might feel that they provide value by critiquing the work, right? Trying to find mistakes. 
with the co-creation, the things are very much different because they rely on each other that they need to make this work, right? And, and that's kind of really important when it comes uh, to that. But uh, going specifically to this question, the idea is that, sorry, my daughter is here. Uh, the, the idea is that um, actually once you're in the flow together with the author, the you know it allows you also to throw with every line of code to 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 think about the the feedback that that you're able to 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 provide and you know you're like kind of deep into the into this this work so to say okay thank you then that's a question from petty which tool do you use to draw causal loop di diagrams um, so this was drawn in uh, Miro, Miro. Um, I'm still looking for uh, for ideal tool when it comes to that. So, <laughs> yeah, but it 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 was um, good enough, so to say. Thank you very much. There was an early question from Reto. He asked about the wait time. Is it business hours or is it overall day time? <laughs> Uh, that's a very important question. It's actually overall time and we should measure overall time. Why? Because this is customers don't care like when do we work, when it's outside of business hours, right? If they don't care if we don't work during the weekends, right? The sooner you're able to provide the feedback, uh, and, I mean, the, the work um, and the value, the better for them. So it's in the total times, not out, outside of business hours. Oh, sorry, business hours, yeah. Then from Björn, did you also look at the nature of the changes? For example, is it real code or just boilerplate, config files, etc.? I would imagine that is, uh, this might influence the gains of the sync approach. Um. Uh, yes. So the things that I that they uh, filtered out were these mm -hmm. like config or boilerplate changes in a sense of you know updating libraries like these these changes that take very short time but produce huge um, huge PRs right. So those are the outliers that were filtered out when it comes to that. So it was mostly focused on this so to see real real work right, uh, coding a feature on some carrier factors or whatever. Okay, thank you. So a question from Kristen. At time you can't avoid big PR. What step can you take in order to reduce the wait time for these PRs? How often should you sync with the rest of the team in order to avoid going in the wrong direction? Um, I think it's it's valuable to to kind of question uh, this this idea of why big PRs are really uh, necessary. At, at least when it comes to this work, it really takes a lot of time to to develop. Mm -hmm. uh, but then um, I, I don't really know the con this context. So in order to you know sync um, often with the other other team members, it's really important you know to have availability from from their side, right? So either like a couple of times per day or trying to provide this feedback. Yeah, that's, that's the thing that is uh, really kind of important uh, in that sense. And the last question from Daniel is, what about not doing pair programming, but pair reviewing synchronously? Yeah, that's also one of the option. Um, although um, I might be, until I get the review, I might be way off, so to say, right? I might be, you know, straight, straight away in a sense of doing work for three days and not realizing that I made uh, lots of the mistakes around there. So it's better than doing async code reviews, right? Doing sync code reviews, but even better is if we both reduce the size of the PR by, and, and also get continuous code review by uh, doing, uh, by co-creating together, which means that size of the batch is going to be one and we're also going to have immediate code review, which are the best of both worlds to have. Thank you very much, Dragan. Thank you. So uh, I have a lot of more questions. So I'm looking forward to, to speak with you afterwards on in the Wonder.me room. Uh, please join us if you have time. Um, uh, yeah, that's it uh, for today. Uh, it was a pleasure.
having you here, Dragan, and uh, thank you very much for coming. And uh, again, Merry Christmas, all the best for, next, for the new year, and see you soon. Yeah, Happy New Year's, Merry Christmas, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, to follow up us uh, for the full year 2021. Uh, it was a wonderful year. We had a lot of good speakers, include Dragon and uh, Uncle Bob, that uh, we had in June, and others, Sandro Mancuso and others. And next year, we're going to try to bring Hansen uh, speakers again for uh, for both communities. Thank you very much. And I hope we meet in the Wonder Mish just after. Thank you. Okay, so bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.